Ibn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who take shaitan as their protector and those who befriend shaitan and those who allow themselves to have a link with the devil. Obviously that devil would come to us either in the form of a whisper from the devil or in the form of a human being. Whenever there is a person with bad qualities, remember you should not befriend them. Stay far away from them no matter what. Because shaitan will come to you through them. And this is how we get entrapped by shaitan. He uses evil people to come to us and to befriend us and to be in our circle so that we become evil with them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about uh, and this issue in Surah Al-A'raf. Allah says, Fariqan hada wa fariqan haqqa alayhimu dhalala. There are two groups. Groups, that, a group that Allah has guided and a group that is deserving of misguidance. Why would a group be deserving of misguidance? Allah says, they have indeed taken the devil as protectors besides Allah and they feel that they are rightly guided yet they are astray. How can we take the devil as a protector besides Allah? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter tells us that there are people who think they are guided yet they are in misguidance because that's what shaitan does. Shaitan misguides us to the degree that we think we are doing a good job, but we are not. One of, the, one of the negative effects of shaitan is that a person who is in the clutches of the devil will always think they are doing right. Yet, they will be doing wrong and they will be engaged in evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how shaitan beautifies the evil. And in many places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Shaitan has beautified for them. Shaitan has made fair seeming for them their evil deeds. Shaitan has made fair seeming for them their evil deeds, which means he beautified the evil deeds. So a person comes and he'll argue with you, telling you, no, this is right. This is definitely right. There's nothing wrong with this. Come on, what am I doing? It's not wrong. How can it be wrong? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, I am calling you towards goodness. The devil is calling you towards evil. If there is any rule that I have laid, Allah tells us, then you should know that it is a rule to enhance yourself in every single way. Success lies in following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Success will not come to us just by us sitting down and making a prayer for success. We need to make an effort as well. A huge effort is required to adopt the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as abstain from prohibitions. This brings us to the next point. What shaitan does when he wants to entrap the Muslims, he makes them, and I think a lot of us are guilty of this. Shaitan makes us feel that we only have to fulfill the commands. And he makes us forget about abstaining from prohibitions. So you find a man, mashallah, with a long beard, with a huge turban, reading salah in the first saf or in the second saf, always there. MashaAllah, promoting good, telling everyone to read Salah, going to everybody's home, inviting them towards Islam. But when it comes to backbiting, he, he's not worried. It's like not even a sin. He says, look, I'm reading my Salah. I'm giving my Zakah. I've been for Hajj. I fast in the month of Ramadan. I've said my Shahada. Now what am I worried about? That man is in the clutches of Shaitan. May Allah protect us. And it would be me or you if we do the same. Remember, in the same way that there are commands, there are prohibitions. What shaitan does, he'll then tell you, no, I am already dressed properly, so I'm a better Muslim. Allahu Akbar, there are some people who might not be dressed like you, but they might be even better Muslims. They might have a deed that Allah loves more than any of the deeds that I have done or you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is why when a person belittles the sin of backbiting, of deceiving, of cheating, of slander, of lying, of causing disunity and so on, these are major, major sins. When people belittle them and don't, re, don't regard them as big sins and people continue engaging in them, then it is time for them to understand and realize that they are in the clutches of the devil. If they do not turn as soon as possible, wallahi, it will result in their destruction and regret in the hereafter. And this is why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
in, in a different wording. Allah says it is ten times more difficult to protect a good deed after it is done. It is ten times more difficult. To read salah is the easiest thing you could do. I can read salah now. We can, we've just stood, mashallah, for so long for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether or not that salah is going to remain with me up to the day of judgment is a different issue altogether. Because as soon as I go out of here, if I backbite someone, there is a chance that my salah will now go to them because I need to pay for that. It's a fine. And if I have deceived someone, my zakah goes to them. If I have slandered someone, accused them of adultery, which is one of the biggest crimes, my hajj goes to them. When I come on the day of Qiyamah, there will be nothing left. So we belittle this issue. That's why the, the Quran says, Man jaa bil hasanati falahu ashru amthaliha. Allah says, whoever comes on the day of Qiyamah with a good deed, we will multiply it for them by 10. But whoever does a good deed, is it immediately multiplied? No, it's not immediately multiplied. According to the tafsir of this verse, which is also mentioned in a book known as Ma'arif al-Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that to do your deed is easy. But if you come with it on the day of Qiyamah intact, still in the jewelry box, then we will multiply it by 10 because you deserve the multiplication. You have protected it. You did your deed and you carried on doing good and you did not worry about others. You didn't give away your deed. And this is why one hadith says, Atadruna manil muflis. Do you know who is the bankrupt person? In a nutshell, the hadith tells us a bankrupt person is the one who comes with a lot of salah, a lot of zakah, a lot of good deeds on the day of Qiyamah, but they have backbitten this one, sworn that one, slandered that one, accused this one. So the salah goes there, the good deeds go there, they owe that one, they owe this one. They are left with no good deeds and they still have a line of people waiting, saying, but they've also cheated us and lied about us and so on. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the evil deeds of those people are then taken and put onto that person. And then this person is cast into hellfire. Yet when they came into, into that particular day of Qiyamah, they had lots of good deeds. These are the people who did not protect their good deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever make us entrapped by shaitan. This is why a question every single one of us needs to ask ourselves every day. How did shaitan come to me today? Because anyone who thinks shaitan did not come to them within a period of 24 hours is a fool. Allahu Akbar. Shaitan has tried his luck with me and you every day, every time of the day he is trying his luck. He promises Allah solid promises. We read some of them tonight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is telling me and he is telling you that I'm going to lead them astray. I promise you, I swear an oath that I will lead them astray. Backbiting, mashallah, people have excuses for backbiting. Yeah, these are some of the excuses for backbiting. I can say this to his face. Tabiqi, go say it to his face. Why are you saying it behind his back then? You think yani, the fact that I'm able to say it to his face makes it not backbiting? No, it's backbiting. Or some other brothers, they're more talented. They start speaking about a brother and then like they don't know. By the way, is this backbiting? Yeah, and if it's backbiting, I'll stop. What do you think it is? Do you see him here? Taib is backbiting. Yeah, would you, let me just check it yeah, from a fiqh standpoint. Is this backbiting? Oh, oh, oh mashallah. Yeah? You're giving it this really yeah, knowledge kind of covering for her. Huh? No excuses for backbiting. No excuses for it. And Allah likened it to eating the flesh of your brother while he's dead. One of, the, one of the scholars, he invited some people for his house for, for, yani, for food. So he, he, brought the, he brought out yani, some of the, the bread and now he's going to go get the meat. So they start backbiting on someone. So he wants to tell them indirectly, stop backbiting. He said, SubhanAllah, people before you used to eat the bread before the meat. But you guys are starting with the meat. You understand? You know what that means? You're already eating the flesh of your brother. <laughs> we didn't even start, the bird didn't even come. You start with meat immediately. A man came to Sufyan al-Thawri, the great scholar Sufyan al-Thawri, and he said, I have never seen Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, I've never seen Imam Abu Hanifa backbite anyone. So Sufyan al-Thawri said, Naam, Abu Hanifa a'aqal min an yusallit ala hasanatihi man yadhabu biha. Yani he said, Abu Hanifa is too intelligent to let someone go away with his good deeds. What does it mean? It means that, you backbite people, they take it from your good deeds on the day of judgment. Yeah? You want a good helpful tip? Especially if you hate someone, don't backbite them. Why? Okay, imagine this guy, you hate him, he's a really nasty person. 
So then he comes and he says, give me your, your iPad, for example, and you give him your iPad. Would you give him your iPad? No. Would you give him your, your, your laptop, your Samsung Galaxy notebook, all this stuff? You wouldn't. Would you give him your, the best and most valuable thing to you, your good deeds? You shouldn't, right? But this is what people do now. So you backbite someone you don't like, you're giving them your good deeds, right? And this is the thing that's most beloved to you. So only backbite people you love a lot, they give them your good deeds. No, don't backbite anybody. Sufyan al-Thawri, again, rahimahullah, the great scholar, someone came to him and he said, these people are talking bad about you. Now, this is something great that he did. Do this next time you hear someone's talking bad about you. Sufyan al-Thawri sent them a bowl of dates, yani a bunch of dates with a note or a message yani, that said, it had come to my attention that you have assigned to me and yani you have given me some of your good deeds. I couldn't find anything with which to thank you besides this bowl of dates, so please accept it from me. Try it now. Next time someone is bad mouthing you and stuff, just send them some candy and a note. And he, thank you very much. Yeah. I heard you gave me some of your good deeds. Please accept this candy bar from me. Try that. See if the other bad mouth you again. Yeah. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to come and thank you. Well, thanks for the candy bar. <laughs> There's nothing you can say now. Khalas, you destroyed this guy, right? It says here. How can you make Tawbah for wronging other people? Very good question. Wonderful question. Making Tawbah from wronging other people is the most crucial one. And the most dangerous one. Because Allah forgives, but people may not forgive. Isn't that correct? Allah may forgive without even you asking Him. But people may not forgive, even for the smallest things. So. Rasulullah Sallallahu taught us something. If you have wronged someone, you have to go to them and seek their pleasure. Okay, now the ulama spoke a lot about that, especially about backbiting. Go to them and seek their pleasure. So if you had wronged them and they know about it, go to them. Like in front of them. There's a little story about Abu Bakr Adilan, another Sahabi, where they argued about a piece of land which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi gave to share between them. And he said, this little section was mine. The other one said, no, Rasulullah meant it for me. So Abu Bakr accidentally said something that hurt the other Sahabi. They all stopped. And Abu Bakr cried. He grabbed him and said, take your revenge. Take your revenge. Take your revenge. Say the word back to me. He said, no, Allah, I will not say it back to you. So he went to Rasulullah to complain. And the Sahabi reached there. And Rasulullah said, is it true what Abu Bakr said? He said, yes. Is it, is it true you did not say the word back to him? He said, yes. He said, please don't say anything back to him. Say, Ghafar Allahu laka ya Abu Bakr. So the Sahabi kept saying, Ghafar Allahu laka ya Abu Bakr, Ghafar Allahu laka ya Abu Bakr, until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's beard was soaked with tears. Now, the point of that story is, do anything that it takes to make it up to the person whom you've wronged. That's one. If he, he or she still doesn't forgive you and you've tried everything you can, then you've done what you can, Go back and make dua for them. Every time they're mentioned, make dua for them. Until you die. Wallahi, this is something I did, I did once. Every time that person mentioned, I made dua for them. And whenever they are mentioned in bad, you mention them in good, in front of the people. That's one way of compensating. Now if that person never forgives and you die and they never forgive, well then that's subhanAllah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from arrogance. I hope they're not arrogant people. Because you are not more merciful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is wronged more than anyone else. So you've done what you can and there's this beautiful hadith which I read about Rasulullah in a book called uh, Madarij al-Salikin. No, it was called uh, Bustan al waizin some daif hadith in it, some authentic. And the hadith says about al-Sirat where the believers when they're crossing going to Jannah they reach the last station and two believers are stopped. And uh, they say, <coughs> I have a right with my brother. And Allah loves them both. So then Allah says to one of them, or sends an angel to say, forgive him if you want. And he says, no, I don't want to forgive him. And then Allah says to the angel, say to them to look behind them. They look behind them and they see a beautiful palace like the palace they've never seen before. And they say, would you like that palace for yourself? And they will say, yes, I would do anything for that palace. And say, the reward of that palace is for those who forgive their Muslim brothers and sisters in Islam. And he forgives them, and they both hold each other's hand and enter Jannah. 
So if it's not dealt with here, Allah doesn't let it go. If He loves you both, on a day of judgment, He will settle it by rewarding one of you to compensate you for what you've tried and forgive you. Now, if you have backbitten the person, that person doesn't know about it. You've wronged that person and they don't know about it. So this is one when he, when he knows you do everything. But if they know, don't know about it, what should you do? The ulama said, number one, you can go to them and apologize to them. But if you know that by apologizing to them, it will make the matter worse, then go back to the company of people whom you wronged him in front of. And make sure that you fix what you said in front of those people in public to them and show them that you had wronged him and take their oath not to repeat what you had said. And then after that, whenever that person is mentioned in bad, you mention them in good. Or if it's true, be silent and make dua for that person. That's the way insha'Allah. Or you can give a sadaqah on behalf of that person. These are the ways that we compensate for wronging other people. If the wrong had caused damage to them, we have to fix the damage. You know, for example, in the Quran, whoever is killed, mudluman, killed by mistake from the people, then you have to compensate their family with blood money. If their family forgive you, then you're off. But the point is, you need to look after their family because they have no more. If it was a man, for example, a husband, no one to look after. The point is, if there's damage, you need to fix that 